Welcome. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to uh, welcome Brian Jacob here this afternoon as uh, as the University of Chicago distinguished alumnus uh, representing the higher school. When when we were approached some months ago about uh, the possibility of inviting someone to talk on our behalf at the 500th convocation, uh, we first thought we were too young to have a distinguished alumnus because one thinks of distinguished alumni as being old, you know, bent, uh, <laughs> gray-haired, if haired at all, people who mumble inconsequentially, but were very famous 40 or 50 years ago. And we didn't have anybody like that, apart from the current faculty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we, we, we wondered whom we should have. And then we suddenly realized that if you removed the obstacle of age, that we did have distinguished alumni, and that Brian it really was the one who best represented what we think of ourselves as doing. Uh, he has a, 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 an important position now, which I will read to you, because I no longer memorize things as easy as I used to. Uh, he's the Walter H. Annenberg Professor of Education Policy and Professor of Economics at the Gerald R. Uh, at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. This is an inferior institution. So <laughs> As indeed, if you listen to the president earlier today, all institutions are, by definition, inferior institutions. This is an inferior institution located in the cornfields a couple of hundred miles east of here. Uh, we were glad to rescue Brian from this ignominious fate for at least a couple of days. He gave a talk yesterday as well. Many, many of you attended. Uh, and he's giving us a, a talk, the title of which I think shows his, his grounding in, in social science. It's long, it has very few verbs, and it has a colon in the middle. Uh, and the words are pretty much haphazardly arranged, uh, but I'll read them to you anyway. It's called The Effective Employment Protection on Worker Productivity, colon, Evidence from Public Schooling. As an exercise yesterday evening during some speeches at an event I attended, I tried permuting these words pretty much haphazardly and found that they all made just as much sense as the title of this talk. However, I'm... Uh, Brian is the person who's going to speak here in a moment. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Brian. I look forward greatly to hearing what he has to say. Once he finishes, uh, he will be happy to take questions. And he said that he particularly wanted unpleasant, nasty questions delivered in a, in a, in a confrontational tone of voice. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, if it wasn't confrontational, I would just forget where I was. So um, uh, the demography workshop yesterday was much too polite and uh, friendly. So, um, But uh, it's a great honor to be back here. It's very fun to come back to Chicago and to the Harris School. Um, and I uh, hope I have been able to put together something that you will find interesting. Uh, Colm told me to talk for about a half hour uh, kind of a, in a general, non-technical level, and then to answer questions, um, so that's what I'll try to do. Uh, the title of my talk, uh, I, I won't try to rearrange the words, but apparently if you, if you do, it doesn't make any difference, um, is the effective employment protection on productivity, evidence from the Chicago public schools. Much of my research is on schooling and on the Chicago public schools, uh, not a surprise since I was a, a student here. But I think the motivation for the paper is captured in this quote uh, by Steve Jobs, the Apple co-founder, what kind of person could you get to run a small business if you told them that when they came in, they couldn't get rid of people that they thought weren't any good? And this, is, this sentiment is kind of quite common among you know, one stream of education reformers, uh, and it's quite common among kind of uh, critics of employment protection in other occupations and industries. Um, and so this is uh, generally the focus of the talk. So why should we care about job protection and public education? I think there's a few reasons. One is, uh, and one probably the most important reason from a public policy perspective, is that it may influence student achievement. Um, teacher labor markets currently, uh, teacher labor contracts currently make it very difficult to dismiss teachers for cause. This is a statistic that uh, someone I know in the New York City Department of Education calculated. This is over the last few years. There were 50, only 50 out of 75,000 teachers in New York City were dismissed for cause. Um, there was a recent uh, article in the New York Times Magazine, I bet, uh, I think it uh, was, New York Magazine. Um, uh, so I, as Jens will attest, I have three young children now, and so I don't really read anything anymore. Um, 
so I heard about this article, and I'm familiar with the rubber room. This is a room where teachers that the, uh, the school superintendent in New York uh, wants out of the classroom but cannot uh, simply fire. So he, they sit in a room all day and do nothing um, and get paid for it. Uh, and it's called the rubber room. Uh, there's, there's also evidence that there's substantial variation in teacher effectiveness. Um, there, there's, in the prior work on teacher labor markets, has fo focused largely on teacher supply um, and has investigated things like uh, how do the, the quality and quantity of teachers respond to salaries or um, bonuses or working conditions, now, focusing on the supply of teachers. There's been very little work, I think, on the demand side of the teacher labor market, um, which uh, one might think is due to the fact, well, there's never excess demand, um, or never excess supply, and so kind of any sort of demand decisions are less relevant. Um, I think it turns out that that's certainly not true, at least in the last decade. Um, just some recent statistics from Chicago, 10 applicants, uh, you know, certified, uh, you know, officially certified teacher applicants per position. And the New York City Teaching Fellows, which is an alternative certification route, several years ago had um, almost 18,000 applicants for 2,000 spots. Um, and they pr predominantly focus on uh, secondary school teaching and often in math and science where people have thought there are traditionally greater shortages. So I think, um, uh, in, I think the other reason that we should care about employment protection and public education is I think uh, studying this may shed light on employment protection policies more generally. And this is a, uh, a critical area within labor, labor and personnel economics. There's been a lot of research done on this in the past. Uh, it's particularly a uh, hot topic in kind of European countries where employment protection is more widespread than in the U.S. Um, and so I'm hoping uh, that we can learn a little bit more generally about this issue from studying uh, public schooling. So is it obvious? Someone you might ask yourself, and I kind of asked myself initially, well, of course, you know, if teachers can never lose their jobs, of course they're going to work less hard and be less productive. I mean, is this even an interesting question? The answer must be yes. I think it's not quite as obvious. Um, uh, a, few, a few facts to support that. One, productivity is not higher among districts without strong uh, teacher unions um, and in southern states where there's uh, kind of, uh, those are right to work states. Um, the, the benefits of this managerial flexibility kind of in any standard economic model depend on the supply of labor. If there's a very uh, inelastic supply of labor, then uh, uh, principals can try to fire whoever they want, and there's no warm bodies to fill the classroom, and you wouldn't expect any productivity, increase, productivity increases. Uh, in particular, this, the policy that I'm going to talk to you about today focuses on young teachers, um, uh, and those are often not the ones that we would typically think of as having a lack of motivation being you know, the standard, the stereotype of the teacher that superintendents would like to dismiss is the older, burned-out teacher. Um, and finally, the incentives for principals themselves are very modest. Um, even in No Child Left Behind, the world of uh, test-based accountability, um, it is, uh, there is not the same motive for the, the leader, the management of a school, to uh, make efficient uh, its work structure as there might be for a private sector company. Um, in the old days, I think, with, um, when there was even less accountability for school administrators, um, one might argue that, you know, if it uh, has any cost to them at all, there's really no benefit for, you know, um, taking advantage of any managerial flexibility. So, uh, overview of the project. Um, this is the primary research question. Will policies that provide principals with greater flexibility to dismiss teachers improve student achievement. Um, I'm going to be looking at a specific case uh, in Chicago. In 2005, the Chicago Public Schools changed their uh, uh, labor contract um, in a way that gave principals virtually complete flexibility to dismiss probationary teachers in years one through four. I'll kind of talk about that more uh, in a moment. Uh, this project is kind of, has two pieces to it. One is a comparison of dismissed versus non-dismissed teachers within the school as a way to kind of examine principal preferences, which teachers and which teacher characteristics are they valuing most highly. Uh, the other is trying to get at you know, the, the overall impact of the policy on productivity, um, and that's involving a comparison of productivity changes between tenured and probationary teachers before and after the policy change. Uh, 
I'll, I'll go into that uh, in, in the next. Yeah, it was basically the, the contract was up. They were it was in the process of renegotiating the contract that uh, the uh, the public school district was able to kind of get this concession, and I'll tell you a bit more. Um, outline of the talk a little bit about the prior literature, background on the teacher dismissal policy, uh, some anecdotal evidence uh, from an interesting, very interesting data source uh, on the effects of the policy. And then I'm going to just summarize kind of briefly the findings on what teacher characteristics principles value most highly, and findings on whether job protections do influence productivity or the measures of productivity that I have, and then some conclusions. So prior research on employment protection. Um, this is a kind of a major topic of study uh, outside the US, particularly in European countries. Um, there's a large theoretical literature and a much smaller empirical literature. Most of the empirical literature focuses on kind of national policy changes comparing countries <coughs> in Europe to other countries in Europe before and after changes in employment protection. And the focus of interest in this research is mostly looking at changes in employment and job mobility and job flows. Do, do workers flow more easily from one job to another um, when there's less employment protection? Um, uh, there have been a number of uh, kind of cross-country studies that, that you know, are largely inconclusive. Uh, recent, some, with, with some exceptions, have recent within-country studies show little effect on employment. There's very little uh, evidence on what you would think of as kind of productivity effects. Um, one study uh, that does focus on this focuses on a, uh, employees in an Italian bank uh, that get tenure after three months. And the authors were able to look at personnel data and track uh, worker absences before and after the three-month mark. And they found that uh, absences increased for men after this three-month three -month tenure mark. Um, uh, and there's some work uh, by Otter and colleagues on wrongful discharge laws in the U.S. Um, kind of the most convincing part of that work does, again, focus on employment and job flows uh, as well. So I think this is, I'm hoping that this, this study makes a contribution to the the broader literature on productivity effects of employment protection. So research on teacher hiring and firing. Have it within the education world, this has been, people have considered this before. Uh, I think there's, there's a kind of a collection of findings that relate to this topic. There's nothing exactly on point, but I'm kind of um, going to summarize some of the findings that in the general area that relate to this point. Um, there's been a study uh, that asked whether principals hire the, the best teachers and how they define best in a in sort of way, essentially those with the highest academic, academic credentials. And the answer is probably not. Um, uh, in prior work, I've looked at whether principals can actually identify the best teachers in their school. I've been looking at the correlation between subjective principal evaluations and objective measures of teacher effectiveness based on student achievement gains. Um, and value-added measures of student achievement gains. I find that, uh, or my colleague and I find that uh, principals are quite good at detecting uh, the best and the worst teachers, but they have very little power to distinguish um, and kind of the, the broad mid-range of teachers. Uh, there's been some qualitative work on what administrators, administrators look for in a teacher. Um, according to self-reports, you know, one of the, the difficulties of this you know, method of research, uh, uh, according to self-reports, they look for everything. They uh, want a teacher who has good teaching skills, communication skills, enthusiasm, subject matter knowledge, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, but there really has been no, to the best of my knowledge, there's been no prior research uh, on teacher dismissal policies um, and no uh, evaluation of whether this type of change, which is mentioned every time that kind of brought, you know, in large discussions of education reform these days, Teacher tenure, employee job protection for teachers, it always comes up as one of the topics, and yet, to my uh, my knowledge, it's never been studied empirically. Um, uh, so that's the, the short literature review. Um, so some background on the policy. So this policy um, uh, was, you know, start, was started in 2005, the um, 0405 school year. Um, traditionally, in Chicago, it was difficult to dismiss even untenured teachers let alone tenured teachers. Um, it required a lengthy review process. Layoffs are very highly regulated. It is kind of a, you know, through a process known as RIFs, reduction in force, um, where essentially kind of the last hired is the first laid off. Um, 
There was a new collective bargaining agreement that was signed in 2004. As part of this, uh, there was this new provision to give more flexibility to the school district. Now, why did the teachers' unions agree? There's, you know, some mixed uh, views on this. Um, this had been kind of uh, a bargaining chip for many years. Um, the uh, one view is that the, the union president was new that year and kind of gave away the farm that the, the woman who was the president of the teachers' union was, was ousted uh, shortly thereafter. Um, the, the other kind of more, more generous view is there was something of a trade. Um, previously in uh, the Chicago system, there was the equivalent, kind of the K-12 equivalent of tenure track and non-tenure track teachers. So there were many teachers who had been kind of full regular classroom teachers who had been teaching for 30 years and were not tenured. Um, they weren't really even on the tenure track. Once you got on the tenure track, you were probationary for four years and then tenured. But there was no requirement that principals had to put teachers on the tenure track when they hired them. Um, and this was kind of a, some flexibility that uh, the principals had to kind of subvert the employment protection. Um, the unions obviously didn't like this, and the trade was they would, you know, that they would end that, and all newly hired teachers would automatically be on the tenure track. But in exchange, during the first four years during their probationary period, principals really had considerably more flexibility to dismiss them. So that's really the, uh, what happened. Um, it gave principals a flexibility to dismiss probationary teachers uh, for any reason, regardless of seniority or changes in staffing levels. So they could dismiss teachers even if they didn't have to cut any positions in the school. Um, now, this is actually a common practice in, in many small suburban districts throughout the United States. Um, but this, Chicago is really the only large district, certainly the only large urban school district uh, that has or has ever had such a policy, to the best of my knowledge. Um, so how does this work? Uh, I guess the first thing to note is that the official term is not dismissal or firing. It is non-renewal. Um, now that is a, a very important, it was drilled into my head by uh, the HR department at the Chicago Public Schools that that is a very important distinction legally. Um, so I, I am, the purpose of the talk will kind of go back and forth between non-renewal and dismissal. Decisions are made in February and March. Uh, what principals do is they log into a computer uh, system, uh, put in the password for their school, up pops a list of all the probationary teachers in their school. One column is you know, titled renew, the second column is titled non-renew, and they click boxes. You know, um, and actually the, the language, it, it, it's referred to as, um, principals refer to it as each, it, uh, to each other as kind of clicking teachers. How many teachers did you click this year? I clicked five, did you click three? Um, I didn't have to click any teachers. So this is, uh, I think it's, um, I think the important thing to take away from this is it really did make it kind of quite easy to do, um, which I think is an important thing to consider it, when we think about whether there really would be any uh, impact of the policy. It, it, the same, uh, the same due process, you know, kind of legally that, uh, uh, that a employee of kind of any uh, organization could could file that he did been dismissed on the grounds of race or gender or disability status. I mean, the general the general employment protection statutes that apply statewide or federal apply here, but there's no uh, there's no due process within the special to the teacher system here. Yeah, I mean, but this is, so the series, the series of hearings that teachers go through is the standard. I mean, in fact, in all teacher contracts, when we say it's impossible to fire a teacher when people kind of cavalierly say that, it's clearly not impossible. I mean, there are, there is just what, it, what people mean by that is there are a number of kind of lengthy procedural hurdles, which are, you know, had, had and have very good, you know, justification and due process that make it quite difficult. And so, um, the old system was the hearings and you know, a number of observations on the teacher and documenting instances of poor performance and you know then going to an arbitrator and so forth. And that's but that's what was changed here. So this is kind of like an at will employee in any industry. Um, so teachers are notified by May first. Uh, generally, they're notified in March, though. Um, uh, 
it's like for legal reasons and benefit reasons, it's, it's treated like a layoff. Uh, health benefits continue through August. Uh, they are eligible for unemployment benefits, and they can reapply to other positions in the Chicago Public Schools, although they're definitely not guaranteed another job. Um, uh, who's eligible? All probationary teachers. PAT is probationary assigned, probationarily assigned teachers. PATs. Um, uh, it includes all even non-teaching personnel, although in this paper uh, I focus uh, strictly on teachers. Um, uh, in the, uh, the first few years of the policy, principals had to choose at least one reason from a pre-selected set. Um, uh, you know, instruction, classroom management, attitude, professional responsibility, communication, as the reason that they were dismissing the teacher. Although, was, uh, my understanding is, again, this was a legal technicality because they didn't... Um, they didn't even actually have to tell uh, teachers, other than the fourth year uh, probationary teachers, the reason. But it was documented on record somewhere. Um, uh, and then principals have complete flexibility, no hearings. Um, so uh, these are some, just some basic statistics on uh, the policy. So in elementary um, and high schools, you can see the average number of teachers per school in Chicago over this time period is about 30 in elementary schools, 60 in high schools. The average number of probationary teachers was much higher than you might think, roughly a third. Um, now, kind of, if you under, you know, if you kind of recognize the high mobility rates in urban school districts and know that there are a lot of very young teachers, um, this is not out of line with other large urban districts. Um, another important thing to know is the fraction of schools that dismissed one plus uh, probationary teachers. Um, only about 60%. So one thing that I think is you know, quite interesting and kind of quite puzzling is that um, uh, given this you know, broad uh, new flexibility, uh, many, uh, many fewer principals than I would have thought availed themselves of this uh, at all. And this is, uh, the 60% is not correlated with kind of things like school achievement levels. So it wasn't as if all of the high performing schools in Chicago were not dismissing any of their teachers, but the low performing schools were. So it's, this is a bit, uh, still a bit puzzling. I think there's uh, a doctoral student and I are uh, thinking of some qualitative work to better understand that. Um, so the fraction of probationary teachers dismissed, though, you know, is about 12%, 10 to 12%. Um, which relative to kind of the old system, New York City, 50 out of 75,000, is a huge change. Um, uh, the last thing, I think the last uh, columns here kind of point out that a number of, uh, you know, a surprising 40 to 50 percent of the teachers that were dismissed were actually rehired by other Chicago public schools. And I think the, that, that also seems a bit odd uh, initially. The reason for that is that um, some schools used the dismissal policy to uh, get rid of teachers that they thought were kind of poorly performing in an absolute sense, um, and even in cases where they didn't have to cut positions in their school. Other schools, when they faced a position cut, they had to dismiss one teacher that their enrollment dropped and they had to reduce their uh, staff. Um, according to the contract, you have to be the last teacher hired. Now, if they wanted to go out of order, and dismiss a third-year teacher that they thought was not quite as good as this fabulous first-year teacher they just hired, they would have to go through the non renewal process and dismiss them. So uh, in some cases, uh, it was teachers that were being dismissed that were not, um, that may not have been dismissed in the absence of any um, uh, enrollment. Is it really rehired by CPS school or rehired by CPS? Oh, it's not yet. It is. No, very, very tiny. It's, it's uh, very tiny. So. You know, that's, um, they, they wouldn't have been able to see uh, automatically, but they uh, could have called the district or the old principal um, or asked the teacher him or herself. Um, so... There, you know, I, and I think from like kind of casual discussions with the, you know, the half dozen principals I talked to, they, you know, they did do some checking, uh, and a number of them that had high, rehired teachers, you know, just, you know, said they called the old principal and they said, yeah, you know, Bob, you know, Bob's a pretty good teacher. I just had to get rid of someone, and I like to tell the teacher a little bit better, but I think 
you can do anything with your data much here. So uh, that's um, okay. Uh, if you start, if you are rehired and start working by November first, you keep your probationary status. If you're not rehired, if you, your clock resets if you're hired after November first. You know, to be honest, I haven't, uh, I haven't looked at, uh, looked at that. I think that'd be difficult to. Uh, really interpret though because you know a first year probationary teacher is let go is probably a very different case than a teacher a third year probationary teacher who survived two rounds of not being dismissed but is then let go and so I think it would be hard to kind of interpret the differences that you would find Things that returns to experience flatten out, you know, uh, to a large extent by year three or four. So the, the, there's there's a lot of good evidence of big improvements in achievement in the first two, three, maybe four years of teaching. It varies some somewhat by subject, um, but uh, but roughly kind of three years. And so this is so. Uh, so this is some of the some of the anecdotal evidence, um, and this comes from the first year of the policy. In addition to marking the five boxes, there's a comment section where principals could indicate, write out the reason, kind of in your know, longhand, why they dismissed the teacher. I think these are uh, kind of just give you a flavor for some of the reasons I think are informative in thinking about the policy. Um, so one, you know, these they, these were kind of the most common responses in these in these categories were they lack effective. Uh, classroom management skills does not provide challenging instructions. That you know they're not really you know the mechanics of teaching aren't that good. Um, uh, the teacher's not in tune with the community and students. Um, and there's bad attendance in the teacher's class. This is from a high school. Um, so there's little doubt in other cases. Some of the comments that you would think that uh, these reasons for dismissal should be correlated with student achievement. Um, uh, this, uh, these are these are verbatim quotes. Um, uh, talking about the teacher is under investigation for child abuse and corp corporal. And it was, this was the principal wrote in corporate, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if that was a intentional uh, stab at the uh, financial establishment. But um, uh, so you know, huge amounts of absenteeism. Uh, and uh, some kind of very odd cases. Uh, I'm not quite sure how cooking in the classroom would affect uh, <laughs> student achievement, but they're, these are they're kind of clear cases of you know poor performance. Uh, now, uh, excessive out sleeping at his desk. Um, uh, I forgot about that one. Um, so, on the other hand, there are some dismissals that I think you know. With some fraction of this, you, know, you may not, uh, you might not expect to impact student achievement. Um, this is the example of the case I mentioned before. There's kind of uh, enrollment declines. Um, uh, there's you know occasionally there's some confusion on the part of the principals. Um, you know, kind of uh, dismissing teachers who are leaving anyway, and part of that I understand was kind of strategic to make sure that they had an open position. Um, Part of it is like at least in the first year of the policy, some principals didn't really even understand didn't understand what you know how they were supposed to use this. Um, uh, and the last one is I, I like quite a bit. Um, so uh, so uh, the first uh, the first part of the uh, the first part of the project was. Um, uh, answering the question, what teacher characteristics do principals value most, most highly? Um, the basic strategy here was uh, comparing teachers, uh, dismissed versus non-dismissed teachers within school. This is the kind of academic, the faculty activities are kind of conditional uh, logit models. Um, and uh, I think there's some advantages here over the kind of prior employment protection literature, 
we're actually using the actual you know, revealed preferences, actual decisions of people, as opposed to self-reports on what they value. Um, it's distinguishing between voluntary and involuntary separations. The prior literature, when, they, when you see a, te a teacher moving from school A to school B, people have tried to infer what that means about uh, for teacher supplier demand, but you don't really know from that mobility itself whether it was the teacher being pushed out or voluntarily, voluntarily leaving to go into a new school. Um, there's a few assumptions in the analysis that are, it, we're assuming that principals understand the system. Uh, we're assuming that we can, I can control adequately for measures of teacher supply. I think one concern that I had in this part of the analysis was uh, if it's much harder to find the high school physics teacher, you might be less likely to dismiss the marginally performing high school physics teacher. Um, and so it may therefore show up that you have a preference for people with high math scores. And really, it's not that the principal particularly values teachers with high math scores, but if they didn't want to you know, dismiss any of their secondary math and science teachers because they weren't sure about being able to find a better replacement. Um, and so, uh, you know, in the actual kind of statistical models here, I'm able to control for a whole variety of you know, field, certification area, um, you know, grades they teach, and a whole a bunch of things that will hopefully control for this. Um, so what are some of the findings? Um, so uh, they do appear, uh, dismissal decisions do appear to be correlated with measures of teacher productivity. Teachers are more likely to dismiss teachers with higher absences. They're more likely to dismiss teachers uh, from lower ranked colleges, if you kind of take the standard measures of college rankings. Um, and for a small subset of data, I'm able to calculate student achievement gains and the dismissed teachers have lower value added scores than the non dismissed teachers. Um, in terms of principal and school characteristics, older principals from better colleges um, seem to dismiss a, a smaller fraction of teachers. Uh, and then some teacher demographics. Uh, uh, males and older teachers are more likely to dismiss. Um, the, an interesting interaction here between uh, teacher and student race that's, I think, tied to uh, desegregation rules. Uh, so, teachers are, more, are less likely to be dismissed as the fraction of students in the school of their, uh, matches the race of the teacher. Because black teachers are less likely to be dismissed if they are in kind of predominantly African American schools. White teachers are less likely to be dismissed if they're in less predominantly African American schools. They're not in the predominantly Caucasian schools uh, in Chicago. But this is, I think, this is tied partly to principal preferences of believing in role model effects. Um, but partly tied to desegregation rules that apply, that did apply at that time, uh, I believe so do, uh, teacher distributions as well as student distribution. Um, so, uh, how could the policy impact teacher productivity? This is kind of part two. Did the policy overall improve teacher productivity? I think it's important to think through kind of the different mechanisms through which the, the policy could have this impact. And there are a few different ways. One is maybe what I would call a purely a compositional effect. I mean, if you really can identify and dismiss the very low productivity teachers, assuming you're hiring back even the average teacher, on net your teachers will look more productive just because the composition of your teaching force is um, you might uh, There might be incentive effects. This is, I think, the first thing that people think of, certainly the first thing that I would think of. You know, I'm now worried about job security. I know I shouldn't be absent 30 times because I may be dismissed, so I'm going to reduce my absence. Um, there could also be spillover effects. Um, you can imagine effects um, if probationary teachers are working harder, the you know the tenure teacher in the same third grade uh, cohort as that you know, probationary third grade teacher uh, might feel compelled to or uh, kind of have benefits of working harder as well. Uh, teacher supply effects. This is something that turns out doesn't seem uh, really important in data. But what this policy essentially did was made the teaching profession in Chicago somewhat more risky and didn't have any kind of compensation and salary. And so all else equal, you might expect that to kind of shift the supply curve of teachers inward. Um, looking at kind of the number of the application rates for positions in Chicago, it doesn't look like that happened, but that's you know, certainly one mechanism that you can imagine affecting teacher, uh, teacher productivity. Um, 
Yeah, they certainly uh, they certainly could be. I mean, there's been you know the fraction of alternatively certified teachers in Chicago has been growing steadily over the last I guess, like, you know five years, you know five to eight years. But next, that could be true. Um, No, that's yeah. No, that's right. It's that's a good point. So, so right. I'm when I say there's less job security, I'm thinking strictly of this aspect of the the policy. But you're right. And if you now take into account that they're on the tenure track, right. It's so yeah. That's a good point. Uh, and then it's possible that teachers uh, principals change their kind of. Uh, the hiring practices in response to this, which you can imagine might influence teacher productivity. Uh, so what, how do I kind of empirically look at uh, the effect of the policy? Basically, I'm examining uh, how pro the productivity of probationary teachers changed after the introduction of the policy. And the comparison group is uh, how productivity changed among tenured teachers. Um, so it's a, you know, uh, a difference in difference estimate. Uh, for those of you who uh, care about those sort of things. Um, and the primarily, primary measure of uh, teacher productivity I'm using uh, is teacher absences. Um, I think there's a few reasons to use this one. It's very well measured and easy to interpret. It's actually been used for you know, to measure productivity in other occupations before. Um, it does impose a financial cost in the districts. There has been some research recently that is, you know, Providing relatively strong causal evidence, there's a causal effect of teacher absenteeism reducing student achievement. There's you know, still not perfect, but I think there's some good evidence that that, that is a, uh, an effect. Um, and at least there's certainly evidence that uh, teacher absences are at least partly discretionary. Now, if we thought that teachers could never control any of their absences, this wouldn't be a good measure of productivity, at least in terms of evaluating the impact of the policy. But there's evidence from other areas that they're at least partially discretionary. So what uh, I'm kind of just laying out a few of the pictures that show the trends that uh, uh, kind of document the effect. So here, the policy, this is teachers in 2003, 2004, this is before the policy. The uh, contract was signed in the summer of 2004. So this is the spring year, this is the 0405 year. And so uh, this is the first year in which the policy is in place, second year, third year. You have uh, probationary teachers and tenure teachers, roughly uh, equivalent initially, about the same, uh, you know, four and roughly the same trend. But then afterwards, you see the gap begin to open up and put, uh, absences. This is the total number of absences, days absent on average per year. Um, uh, decline for probationary teachers at a faster rate than just the tenure teachers. So this is, um, this is evidence of the policy, you know, uh, it did have some uh, impact on reducing the future absence here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so in some models, uh, I can look actually within teacher um, and to see. I don't focus on that as much here because um, you said that a teacher fixed effect way of identifying this. And the difficulty there is. Um, that overwhelmingly, as you might expect, teachers who are dismissed are dismissed in their first year. I mean, you know, if, if a principal is not happy with a the teacher, they know it in the first year and they try to dismiss them. Um, so, uh, and it's, it's possible that there's kind of heterogeneity in treatment effects. The biggest effect would be for first year teachers. And you know, by definition, you can't be a first year teacher under both regimes. I mean, if you're a first year teacher in 04 when there was no when there was no possibility of being dismissed, then you're going to be a second-year teacher, and so you can't really estimate the effect on the group for whom you might be most interested in using this approach. And so that's... Um, I, um, well, you know what, I think uh, you mean from 06, 07? Um, there's nothing... Uh, there's nothing particularly obvious. I mean, but one thing to note is that uh, in the first year of the policy, by definition, this is only taking into account the incentive effect because no teachers have been dismissed as of yet. In 06 and 07, in addition to people becoming more familiar with the policy, both teachers and principals, 
you, you have some of the composition effects that begin to work their way in. Way in. So I think um, the, the increasing effect over time is probably both because there's a composition as well as an incentive effect, but also because the um, incentive effect may have increased a bit over time. And that's why, you know, in the full version of the paper, I look at that a little bit. Um, so, uh, so this is actually one kind of little check that you can do for the data. Um, uh, one might be a little worried in this prior specification. Um, uh, many probationary teachers are young teachers. And if there is something going on in Chicago or in education, they were changing alternate certified teachers, it was somehow disproportionately affecting young versus old teachers. You might be worried that what this effect really represents um, is uh, just something happening with young teachers that isn't necessarily this dismissal policy itself. But remember uh, that I mentioned that uh, many of the tenure, one of, many of the previous, previously um, unappointed teachers who are not on the tenure track were kind of put on the tenure track. So they're actually, that breaks the connection between age and probationary status. So there were older, more experienced new probationary teachers, right? And so if you actually look at the data and just look at experience level, um, these are the young teachers. These are the older teachers, and there's a mix of probationary and tenured um, uh, within uh, the older ones, uh, within the uh, within uh, the older group. Um, you find no such no effect at all. So I think this is uh, a nice kind of falsification test that you can do, uh, ruling out anything any factors that might be just influencing teachers based on their age or experience level. Um, so uh, the effect is much larger for elementary schools than for high schools. Uh, elementary high school. Uh, we also I also looked at kind of how it affects the you know the likelihood of having a very large number of absences. I think one of the ways the policy might be influenced is not really most teachers are you know, working hard, doing the right thing. They probably are not going to change their behavior much. There may be some teachers that uh, you know for whatever reason were. Uh, much less productive than they could have been uh, in this policy might have disproportionately affected them. So looking at the likelihood of having a very high absence of teachers. Um, for elementary and high schools, so a, a number of sensitivity checks basically showing that it is robust to doing lots of different things. Um, main, and so the main point is just to kind of the magnitude, take away the magnitude of the effect from the, those pictures. Um, on average, it reduced total absences by about 0.8 per year from a baseline of 8, which is about a 10% reduction. You know, you know, more for elementary schools, less for high schools. And it reduced the fraction of teachers with 15 or more absences by 3.1 percentage points off of the baseline of 12.3%, so it's about a 25% reduction. So it's a not, it's a, a moderate size effect. Um, uh, differences across school, large and elementary schools. Um, uh, in secondary school, it affects the largely driven by low achieving schools. Um, differences across teachers. I'm rushing through to give at least a few moments for questions here. Um, the effects were larger among teachers with higher rates of absenteeism prior to the policy. This is largely kind of younger and uh, female teachers. Um, uh, Obviously, as I mentioned before, smaller effects on kind of second, third, fourth year teachers who have kind of survived the policy in the past. Um, uh, and then larger effects on teachers in 06 and 07 relative to 05, which may be increasing the awareness of the policy. Um, but did it affect student achievement? So this is actually a difficult question to answer because the data don't link uh, other than a few select years that aren't, uh, that aren't useful for this analysis. Um, Teachers to students. Um, so you ideally you would like to look at kind of the student achievement gains uh, for classrooms with probationary teachers before and after the policy. You unfortunately can't do that with the available data. So what I do is the second best is I look at school level changes in average school achievement after the introduction of the policy. And I'm comparing schools with higher versus lower fractions of probationary teachers in 2005. You know, the intuition here is that teachers. It had a high fraction of probationary teachers in 05, and this is conditional on lots of other things, um, you know, had a, a bigger treatment 
They had you know, more, more people that could be dismissed, more people whose behavior could be influenced under the new regime. Um, and so you might expect larger effects there. But this is certainly not what you would want to do if you had the uh, student level data. So and the answer is maybe a little. In elementary schools, um, an increase of 20 percentage points in the fraction of teachers who are untenured um, is associated with a 1 percentage point increase in the, uh, the, the proficiency rate, which is only really 2 percent increase. Uh, proficiency, about 50 percent of students are proficient according to the Illinois State exam in Chicago. Um, and this, you know, so it's a very significant, but very, you know, quite small. Um, and in high schools, there's nothing. And there's much less of an effect on actually teacher absences in high schools. So that's consistent with this. Um, I think this is not saying that there is a small effect necessarily, because we really can't. This is this is kind of diluting the effect um, by measuring achievement of all students in the school. Um, uh, and so and this is uh, we don't have very good evidence on this. There's some evidence that has it made of a small. Uh, beneficial effect on student achievement. And it may have had a much larger effect, it's just hard to tease out with the available data. So conclusions, um, uh, the non-renewal policy increased productivity among probationary teachers by a, a modest amount. It's hard to discern an impact on achievement, but uh, potentially a small effect in elementary schools. Um, so what are the policy implications? I think it's a reasonable policy for districts to consider. Um, but I think it's, uh, you know, my kind of read of the evidence is it's, it alone, it, it would not, uh, it is not going to be the solution that uh, folks like Steve Jobs think it will be. I mean, maybe part of that. And, I, and the big caveat here is this is just the focus on probationary teachers. And so, actually, that's an important caveat. So, I mean, you might think that the ones for whom this would have the biggest effect are the 30-year burned out veteran. Now, maybe not, but... Um, but at least this specific policy will not, I think, be the panacea that one might hope. Um, I think we need to focus a lot on other avenues of reform. Coming back to it, I think one one thing that's kind of very that's only beginning to be well understood, I think, has implications for kind of labor markets more generally, is the reluctance for I think a variety of social, cultural, institutional reasons for managers to utilize a lot of flexibility that they're given. Um, Forty percent of principals never over the three years, I mean, thirty-five percent of principals never over the three-year period this is any probation at least in their school. Um, now, uh, and this is kind of consistent with kind of other um, other occupations as well, even occupations where there where there is not a strong employment protection. I think there's a lot of things that are kind of going into um, human resource decisions that are not. Uh, strictly a function of um, the rules on the book. Um, and so, I think that is all I have to say. I'm just happy to take any questions. Um, Well, I, well kind of one caveat, and so, so, as people have pointed out to me, um, it's not clear that that's a bad thing. In fact, the, ideally, what the mechanism that one might like to see is the policy goes in place, there's the incentive, the threat. All of the teachers in the school clean up their act and start to be great, so the principal doesn't have to dismiss anyone. So you could actually have big positive, you could have big benefits in the absence of any actual dismissal. I'm not quite sure that's what was happening, but uh, okay. That, I want to get that out there. Um, that's a good question. Um, uh, yeah, I, I recently was tenured, so I'm very supportive of this. But um, so I, I think uh, I think there's I think there's a good case to be made for a lot more accountability of university professors in kind of ways, you know. Uh, it could include tenure, but also, I mean, there's lots of other ways um, in terms of kind of flexes. as Holm and I were talking about over lunch, and the ways of uh, uh, to deal with uh, 
faculty members other than tenure. I mean, I think there's, I think there's essentially, I think there's some, I think the one, the one relative, uh, the one kind of maybe relevant distinction is the kind of academic freedom argument for university professor tenureship. I think is somewhat less applicable to K-12 teachers. I think the, the, the reason that tenure at the K-12 level was started was you know, kind of, uh, to avoid um, discrimination, nepotism. Uh, I think that's still a concern. I mean, that's kind of a due process concern of issues raised earlier. But. That's no, that's a great that's a great question. And there's really no good uh, data on that. I mean, there's data on uh, transitions and separations and mobility, but that's mixing dismissal with uh, I really want a new job versus I mean, think you might want to look for a new job, <laughs> um, which is probably somewhere in between. Um, uh, although it isn't on my list of things to do, there must be good data I can look for it yet. I found it on kind of dismissal and other private sector occupations. Um, uh, is that something I can be used to that? Um, I think it, I think it, I think that uh, it certainly varies, and I think that this is, this relates to one point that I wrote, uh, brought earlier, kind of the fact that there are only moderate incentives for for principals, and there are two different issues. One is what is their objective function, and the other is kind of what are the incentives for them to you know to pursue any particular objective. And I think. Um, I mean, it's not a surprise, but clearly have lots of objectives, and I, and I think they probably should, other than something like you know, the standardized test scores. And they, uh, certainly in this, the, uh, the world of test-based accountability in education now, they have a much, you know, stronger focus on student achievement and student achievement is measured by standardized test scores. Um, and, uh, so their absence is a good measure of, of what is producing. I think the answer is probably, it's certainly it's correlated, it's, it's not a bad proxy, but ideally what we want to like look at is actually student achievements per se. Um, it could be that, uh, and so I think uh, my analysis may be in some ways understating the impact of the policy on true teacher productivity, at the ones that they were dismissing. If I had a measure of enthusiasm or love of children or student achievement, um, that I could track and have these graphs on total absences, but total classroom inspiration. Um, I might find really big changes in you know, that, where I'm only finding modest changes in future absences. And, but, you know, this is, I'm looking for the point under the answer. Um, Um, yeah, I think, I think those are both good things, and I think the, the question is how productivity changes with, you know, within persons and experience is something that we can know pretty well, and I think that's what means. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, um, it flattened uh, after three years. Um, 
I don't know if anyone, is, I, I don't think people have gone, we don't, there's not enough data that people have looked, been able to look at. So it, goes, it doesn't go down, you know, within 10 or 15 years. I mean, you don't, there, you would need data, like 30 years of data to kind of track from the first year person of teaching to a really old veteran. Um, and that data doesn't exist. So it, it could go down after 15 years, but we don't know. Um, I think the other, I mean, I think there's a huge amount of hesitation in teacher effectiveness. Um, you know, even kind of within any observable characteristic you can think of, um, you know, within situation, even within, um, so I think there's probably, this is like somewhat on point, you know, exactly what it's here, I can comment. Um, but there should be scope if, if teacher, if principals can identify effective, uh, least effective tenure teachers and dismiss them, I think there should be scope for considerable improvement. Was it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, well, I think there's um, different ways to answer that. What, what is politically achievable now? I mean, what what do I think kind of objectively one would have to give to kind of get that political trade off? Versus what I think in some normative sense, you know, Brian's personal ethical standard, what is fair. Um, uh, I think kind of in the political feasibility, I think uh, the best option, the most realistic option, are some of the strategies that I think superintendents have tried as kind of, um, basically, at the, you know, uh, as first at the same time you're taking away from the Big salary increases for trade off for less, uh, less salary. Um, this is something along the lines of Michelle Lee, the superintendent of Washington, D.C., proposed something along these lines. Um, I think that, I know politically, I think we have to begin probably then, we have to just start with new teachers and be very hard to so kind of get this institute of existing teaching for it. Um, uh, yeah. You, from, a, um, from an ethical perspective, from Brian's personal ethics, I think, um, assuming there would be some way to still maintain uh, the discrimination that we might be worried about and maintain some due process, I think uh, there would be, you know, very little job security. Okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because of the, the program of lectures all afternoon, we're on the way to the next step site, which uh, I think is still about two of the bikes to finish, although I'm sure this is a little bit of a serious I guess I'd like to finish. I'd like to thank Brian for giving an excellent talk. I think it's kind of my philosophy about here, but you aren't. I'm sure it's fear and how bad it's open. But nevertheless, he believed that the underpinning was sound. So he threw in a couple of super words that ordered a little bit of stuff at this point. Uh, without demonstrating that you understood what they meant. So we're sure that I'm your saying for the picture day. So we're delighted that you came to visit us. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to say that I now appreciate the word wearing the correct order in the title. Okay. That was what you talked about. Thank you very much. Right. Well, thank you.